In the 1950s, blacks were not served at lunch counters in downtown Evansville. At theaters, African Americans were told to sit in the balcony. Blacks were denied access to books at the old Central Library. The overwhelming majority of companies in this region would not hire people of color except for the most menial of jobs. Until the open housing ordinance was passed by the Evansville City Council in 1968, no African Americans lived east of South Kentucky Avenue. In 1964, the Civil Rights Act was signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson. It outlawed segregation in schools and public places. A year later, the Voting Rights Act was enacted. It banned discriminatory voting practices, including literary tests. In 1966, the Reverend John Caldwell became the first black elected to Evansville City Council. In 1970, William Miller was the first black to sit on the Vanderburgh County Council. Four African-American residents of Evansville talk about growing up in a segregated society. Well, Diamond uh, was a little small mining camp. There were two coal mines there, and we were divided by railroad tracks. And the blacks, we were on the north side, and the whites were on the south side. And we had uh, separate schools. And the little school that I went to was a little shotgun building, which was church on Sundays and school through the week. And uh, the whites had their school. And then when we go to uh, theaters, which was in Providence, well, naturally we sit in the back, in the balconies. I guess we just, in, we, we accepted that way because that was it. We didn't, my, my dad was a coal miner and my mom, my mother, she worked for the white women. And I guess that's where some of my, uh, I guess, resentment and stuff came from because I remembered her scrubbing floors for the white women on, their, on her knees and I always said, well, I would never uh, go on my knees and mop nobody's floors. And so from that, a lot of walk-offs uh, came because I walk out. You won't get it clean because I'm not getting on my knees. But uh, it was just a way of life growing up there. It was a sport. On weekends, uh, everything would close down around noon on Fridays. And from there, people get liquored up. And uh, along about 6 o'clock, uh, the sporting of coming through the black neighborhood and yelling and screaming and pelting us with rotten eggs and taking shots at folk was routine. One night, we were sleeping, and uh, we heard this noise where they were outside knocking out all of the headlights in the cars and screaming and shouting, you know, niggers this and all that. And my father grabbed his pearl-handled pistol and ran outside and took a couple of shots. It didn't hit anybody, but it did run him away. I, I knew an Army vet. He was in Germany, married to a German woman. And he was on, he had his next assignment was to go back to Vietnam. And so he thought that he could send his wife to Monroe, Louisiana, of all places, to live with his family while he went on his tour of duty. And unfortunately, the Klan found out that this white woman was living in this black community, and they broke in, bull whipped everybody, terrorized them. I think they said she moved back to Germany after that. On Desert Street, I, I, I never saw this, but I understood that that's where the public hangings would take place of black folks. I knew that it was common that black folks would get hung. Um, that was one of the things that we were always afraid of. Whether you had the wrong guy or the right guy, it didn't matter. Witnessed many cross burnings. And matter of fact, one night I had to run for my life from West Monroe because the Klan was more prevalent in West Monroe than it was in Monroe. I had, had a flat tire. and. Uh, 
happened to stump, drive up on a place where they were burning a cross. Whether they saw me or not, I don't know, but I drove all the way back to Monroe on those flat tires. I met my husband at Tuskegee Institute, Alabama. That was at college. Now you have to remember this was like when I was I was 16 years old because I was in college at 16. So I remember meeting him and he talked about Evansville. Now I'm from Tennessee and things were different, I assumed, in Tennessee than they were in Evansville because we had always been taught about the Mason-Dixon line and all, whatever that meant back then. And that if you came to Evansville, Indiana, you had crossed the river and you had, you were, you know, the Mason-Dixon line, no, that was like, if you get there, there would be no major prejudices and no major uh, discrimination. You could go to any place and eat. You could go to the movie. You didn't have to sit in the back or in the balcony or whatever. So I thought Evansville must be a great place. Well, we got married after I had met him two years from then, from those early years. And I came to Evansville and it was no different from Alabama or Tennessee. I tried to go eat at Farmer's Daughter. I just thought I'd go in and sit down. They just said, get out of here. And I wanted to know why. And I thought, well, I'll go out and tell these policemen that uh, they're trying to put me out of a place and the police, you know, they said, no, you have to go unless you want to go around to the back. And I thought, uh-oh, this is not good. Then when I graduated from Tuskegee in 55, it was like 57, I tried to go to the library to check out a book. That, <laughs> this still has a big impact on me. And if you look around my home, you'll see there's nothing but books, there are books, books. I went to the counter and asked for a book. And the librarian said, oh, yes, we have that book, but you have to go to your library. And I thought, well, she must be just playing a joke on me, something funny. And I said, oh no, I, I don't have a library. I said, I just want this book from here. She said, I can give you the book. I have the book, but I have to send it to your library on Cherry Street. That, that just, that hurt me. Because then I realized something was wrong that I couldn't check out a book because I was black. Because we were Negroes then. So I go, but I went over to the library on Cherry Street and the librarian behind the desk had on the shelves, there must have been about 10 books. And she said the same thing, I can get the book for you in five days. The book was right, the library, Central Library downtown. And I, I, did, I, I couldn't understand that. The only reason I couldn't check out a book was because of my race. And that I had to go way across town almost to get a book and then wait five days to get a book that they already had. That's, it still almost brings tears to my eyes to think that here I was, a college graduate, wanted a book from the public library in Indiana, across the Mason-Dixie line, and couldn't get it. And my, my husband we would always tell me, just let it go, let it, no, I, I can't let that go. They wouldn't let me have that book. You know, that's, um, and, and education was my thing then. It was our thing in Tuskegee. It was still my thing. And to think that to read, I couldn't get a book that I wanted and certainly didn't have at home. And I still, you know, what, books. I, I, buy, I bought too many books because I could not get a book from the Central Library downtown.
Well, in, in the 50s, living in Monroe, Louisiana, of course, uh, we had no social justice uh, to speak of. It, everything was hand-me-down or, uh, or second class. We weren't allowed to go into restaurants. The restroom facilities were for colored only and white only and uh, weren't able to drink out of the water fountain. There were times when you really wasn't supposed to be walking on the sidewalk if a white man was on it. Uh, you had to be respectful of saying, yes, yeah, sir, no, sir. Even going to the store ordering one in a loaf of bread, you couldn't say uh, white bread, you had to say light bread. And so we were under a, a lot of uh, restrictions in terms of what we could do as black people. You had a neighborhood that you were supposed to live in and you weren't supposed to cross it. If you were going to do any work outside your neighborhood, you pretty much had to let somebody know that you were going in that neighborhood. You just couldn't walk in that neighborhood being black, meaning the white neighborhoods. I, I moved to New York um, in the in the mid to late 60s. And, uh, and I found a home there. But certainly Monroe could have afforded me uh, a good life. I had to leave family and friends and, and take on a whole new life uh, in order to find some, some, some equity, some equality, and some value uh, in, in life. So I missed uh, being with school friends and, and, and what have you and growing up in that area and having a good quality life. It plays a big part of your life, low self-esteem, no confidence. You're told where you're supposed to be. You can't do certain things. That was ingrained. It was taught to you by your elders, your, your black elders, you know, that you weren't supposed to do certain things. And it wasn't really until the rebellion it started, you know, in the um, uh, mid-50s to, to 60s, that uh, uh, there was an underfoot movement that things really started to change. And I was walking down Main Street and I seen that I, I knew there was gonna be a sit-in and I just stopped and sit in we were rotating, sitting so many minutes, and it was like a all-day thing. But they just let you sit there. They, we didn't get service. We still didn't get service. The only thing, I guess, it, they lost business that particular day because we had the seats. Well, the early segregation in Tennessee was that it was, everything was segregated. I'm talking about the 1930s. For me, having grown up in Tennessee, a long time before any of the movement, civil rights movement uh, began. Growing up in Tennessee as a young kid, because everybody was so poor, white, the whites that we knew, we played together. We lived next to each other because that's the way it was in a small community of only 500. We didn't experience any animosities toward each other or hate toward each other because we all were living in the same little community, all little poor kids growing up. When it came time to go to school, they went to one school and we went to another which was an all-black school, and they went to an all-white school, which was so much better. The, only, the thing that really always interested me as a little kid was that everything they had was so much better than what we had in terms of schooling. The schools looked better. The seats, everything was better. We just had the worst-looking things, and I, I remember that impacted on me that I never wanted to live like that when I got older. And the kids, they still called each other. They called us niggers. And I still, I didn't understand that because I didn't know the history, you know, slavery and all of that was never talked about in my home because that was like, parents didn't want us to know these things. But that's basically what we grew up with. And since our parents were, my mother was a domestic, she worked for the white people, for white people. But I remember a little kid calling me a nigger and I beat him up, white kid. 
And then when my mother came home, she said, you can't do that because I, meaning she, would lose her job. But I didn't really know why. I didn't even know why we were called niggers because that was never discussed at home. All we were told is that we were never, by my parents, you were never to call anybody those bad names. You don't say that. One is insulated from that because nobody talked about it. It was never talked about at home. Now, I don't know what the whites talked about, even though the kids didn't. We didn't talk about prejudice, any of those kinds of things that I later learned. And when I uh, went to high school, which was out of the small community of, of Tennessee, Adams, Tennessee, so my experiences were not bad. They were just not good. In the 50s, um, I was working, late 50s, I was working at a country club, Bayou to Say Country Club. And uh, the rules were that if you were black, you were not supposed to look at a white woman. You were supposed to uh, turn your head and wait on her with your hands stuck out, and, and she would receive. The young man felt like I didn't do that. He thought I, looked, in fact, looked at her. And he was going to uh, take care of the situation by uh, drowning me in the, uh, in the pool. His grip uh, uh, met my death-defying grip, and uh, we ended up uh, tussling, and, uh, and eventually this, there was a standoff. Uh, there, was, uh, there was many restrictions uh, that you uh, had, to, had to live by. I was working in the license branch in the old courthouse, but we went across the street to eat. And uh, my two friends, as we took our trays, we went push, they went in front of me. And when I pushed my tray up the uh, service, she said, I'm sorry, you have to take that with you. You can't sit and eat. And I said, not, yes, I can. Today I can. And she said, no, you can't. I said, oh, yes, I can. I said, the law was just passed. And so I went upstairs and asked for the manager. And after, I said, well, I'm going to use the phone. I'm called the NAAC president, and I'm going to call the paper, newspaper. And so then he said, uh, uh, they, didn't, they didn't know. They didn't know. And I said, you should have known because the law was passed, and I was denied service. He said, yeah, but that's okay. You can come. You can you come. And I said, yeah, but what about others? So what I done after that, I went on back and I ate, sit down and ate, and then after that I sent, I would send blacks in there, even if I had to pay for the lunch. I made sure that he was going to, they were going to serve people. I do forgive uh, some of the things that might have gone on. Uh, I remember a white man told me one time, he said, boy, do you know what's worse than a nigger? And I said, no, sir. He said, two of them. I can't help but remember Hosea Williams, who was in Georgia, uh, one of the freedom fighters, and the Klan had blown stuff up, and the, and the NAACP and others sued the Klans because they felt the only way to break the claim was to take their money away from them. And uh, Hosea Williams walked up to the, the Klansman and said, see, I didn't sign on to the suit. I tried to be your friend. Would you shake my hand? And the Klan said, nigga, you know your place. And so they had no qualms about saying those kinds of things to you. So when you think back and you still hear that rhetoric ringing in your ear, it does kind of get you a little upset. I guess I'm blessed and fortunate that I can still now be 
working toward part of that change that we see taking place from those days to now. In 1960, the school corporation board or whoever did these, made these decisions at that time said, we are going to send you as the first black woman in an all-white school here on, on, on the east side of Evansville. And I didn't even know where the school was. I never heard of it, you know, because blacks were not permitted, um, you didn't, were not, not accepted on the east side of town, cross Highway 41. You didn't come, you didn't drive, we didn't even drive over here. Interestingly enough, I never knew that the parents protested me coming because they kept it quiet. The teachers didn't tell me, the parents didn't tell me naturally, the principal didn't tell me, and the students were, the kids were wonderful. They ac seemed to have accepted me, except this one student. He decided that he would write the word nigger on the uh, window. And he wrote it so that it could be seen from the inside when I came into the room. He did that. And I called him, I called him in. I knew it was him. I knew it was him, and I said, you wrote the word nigger. And see, I had already had early experiences with somebody calling me nigger, and I beat them up. Well, you couldn't beat up a kid. I didn't want to, but I was mad. As a teacher, I thought, you could keep kids after school. You didn't even have to tell their parents. You didn't have to call them and tell them that you had them, because all the kids was neighborhood school, I guess. I kept him in that room, and I said, now, I'll tell you what you're going to do. I know you're having problems with the word nigger and I'm having problems with it. So here's what we're going to do. You sit right there, and I'm gonna sit right here at the desk, and I want you to say the word nigger and start saying it very, very softly. And then I want you to just scream it, scream it. Say it as loud as you can until you get nigger out of your system. And he started off. He said nigger, nigger, and he got and the tears were just scroll, scroll. And I was crying too because the fact that I knew I had upset him and I didn't really know what might happen with the parents, you know, when he went home and told it. That young man, is, he has brought his kids by to see me. He doesn't live in Indiana anymore, but he, and he remembers that. And he was only, he was eighth grade. The students had been trained uh, by their parents, are told by their parents things that they could not do. So they were, they adhered to that very definitely. In fact, I was accused by my black peers of thinking that I was white because I was with them all the time. Well, I had, I, my friends became people who were white, my associations, and I just never thought much about it until I looked in the mirror, and then I realized, oh, you, this, da 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 da. But it was uh, it was an interesting, great experience for me. It, it was the making of me in terms of my attitudes toward uh, a white community. The whites became accepting, and when they found out that I couldn't go to eat at a restaurant because there was a policy against it. I'm talking about the 60s now. When I couldn't go to Wesselman's cafeteria to eat, you know, we had the Christmas dinner, the big Christmas dinner. When they found that they had a what, Negro teacher at the faculty, they said, no, you can't bring her. That's what Wesselman's cafeteria said. But the teachers told Wesselman's, if she can't come, we're canceling the Christmas party dinner, we won't come. They let me come, go. And God, I choked on that chicken because the thought that I'm paying $3.50 to eat something, they don't even want me here. But that gave me the solidarity of the teachers 
who probably didn't didn't really like having a black teacher there, but who treated me as as, as, as an equal. I was because I, because I was. Oh, I felt good. These people are really, you know, they like me, so to speak. You know, so those are some of the things that uh, I experienced in my early educational years at an all-white school as the only black teacher. That went on for twelve. That was for twelve years. We didn't have any black students. I was the only person there is who of, of color. I remember particularly uh, one day I washed my cab, and um, you take great pride. You wash it up; it's looking nice. And uh, there was a part of town that had mud holes and ditches, and uh, and I was going through on my way to Newtown, and I didn't want to drive through the mud. I, I wanted to have my car clean as long as I could. And there was a white gentleman coming, headed one way, and I was headed another way. He stopped, and wouldn't come through. And I was beckoning for him to come through because I could drive on the dry part where he was. And he's beckoning for me to come through the mud and water. And I'm saying, no, I'm not going to do it. And uh, so he backed up and went through the mud and water and splashed it all over my cab. And uh, when I got back to the, uh, to the cab stand, my father said uh, a white fella had called and said, uh, you got a little smart yellow nigga working for you. If I'd have had my gun, I'd have shot him in the mouth. This was at a time when blacks had started to really sense that they could do something if they had the power and the numbers to go forward. And so at this particular time, my point was that if I had known he didn't have his gun, I probably would have, we probably would have tussled out in that mud and water. It certainly does make you feel lesser than a man um, when someone would say to your face, Things that like, you know, I would have shot you or, or call you the N-word or, or whatever. So there was a lot of disrespect and uh, low value for black man's value during that time. When we first moved to Evansville, I always loved to go back to Providence on the weekends. And so we always knew we were supposed to go to the back of the bus. But the bus driver always come back and peep through that back window to make sure that uh, you was in that back. Then it was in the 40s, and soldiers were traveling to and fro, black and white, you know. And I remember this black soldier, this white soldier got up. His wife was with him, and they were like two or three rows up from the back. And uh, he was sitting, and so the driver was back there checking to see, to make sure we were in the back where we were supposed to be. And he told this black soldier, you cannot, you have to move. And these soldiers, was a bunch of them, because they used to travel back then. They were going all the time, soldiers. They told that driver, we've been in foxholes, we eat together, we've slept together, this is my seat, that's my wife. I told him to sit there, I've been sitting. They said, we'll get out and we'll turn this thing over. And I was so scared. I, and I was just a girl, but I just, you know, and I was scared to death. They said, you have a job to drive this bus. He got up there and he moved on south. My father owned a company called Red Top Cab Company. But even though he was a business owner and he owned those taxi cabs, it was still with restrictions and a lot of limitations. Uh, the, he just could not do what he wanted to do. The white cab companies decided to go to the West Monroe to avoid paying city taxes, but yet they still operated in the city of Monroe. My dad was the only city cab company in the city of Monroe to operate. 
And uh, he had all the restrictions and they had all the freedom. Well, he knew he couldn't go into the white community to pick up anyone without permission, uh, escort. Um, he knew that he couldn't go to the uh, airport and park and wait for the airplanes to come in. Uh, he had to be called while the white cab companies could go and park. That was not a good time for my father. Uh, one is that all the white cabs fleet, had to flee from Monroe to West Monroe because my dad had started to bite into their territory. And Red Top was very popular. And, and everybody, black folks, because that's where they were operating in the black community. And, and black folks didn't have the mode of transportation, so they needed the cab companies. And, uh, and of course, my daddy didn't realize that he would become as prosperous as he, as he was. And my father bought four brand new Biscayne Chevys and uh, somebody sugar tanked them, put sugar in the gas tank and locked up all the engines. My father almost went out of business. He took his watch to a head ads, a, a pawn shop, a finance place, and pawned his watch to stay in business. Yet they were very angry, very ticked off at him because of his success. And years later, I can remember uh, uh, a meeting at the airport with their chief of police and airport director uh, where they were going to allow my father to come now and park years later. And, uh, but they were going to charge him $75 for the slot. Uh, my father coming from as we left the meeting, and I said, Dad, it doesn't sound too bad. He said, I don't want to fool with that mess. He said, if they want Red Top, let them call them. For all those years, they wouldn't let me come out there, and now they want to charge me. You know? So that was my, the beginning of me knowing that my father was more of a radical than I realized. With the advent of the civil rights movement, my, I was determined that my children were going to be able to go wherever they wanted to go. And I was going to do what I had to do to make sure they did that. And I was very involved in their uh, education from the time they went to school until they graduated. But I was determined my kids were not going to, they were going to eat wherever they could or wanted to as opposed to my not having been able to do that. But my parents just, they didn't, uh, they didn't try to go someplace where they knew they couldn't go. When Dr. King surfaced and exposed what we had gone through and what he was fighting for, I was just determined they're not going to treat me like that. And I, in my way, I, when I faced adversity or what I thought might have been adversity, but this wasn't while I was growing up. All of this happened after the movement. I'm not bitter. I, I, I want to work and make things better, you know, for everybody. That's what the NAACP does. It's not a black organization. It was started by Mary Overton, a white woman who was a Unitarian. She started what was the Niagara Movement that later became the NAACP under W.E.B. Du Bois. And so it takes all of our efforts, whites and blacks working together, things have changed. And it's changed in Evansville. And I went to New York after Monroe. And when I got to New York, they were burning and overturning police cars, and it was really bad. I couldn't go to work because they had martial law. So I've seen it quite a bit around the circle.